Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. I want to thank our Basel Art Salon for giving us a space here to talk about um, the art scene in Guadalajara in the recent years, and specifically, we're going to focus on an artist space that's been uh, working for eight years now. So I'll introduce Jose Davila and Gonzalo Lebrija. They're both artists from Guadalajara, and they were the ones that initiated this project that is called Office for Production of Art Projects, or Office for yeah. Art Projects. So Guadalajara is, is Mexico's second largest city, but um, in Mexico, almost all the federal budget for culture goes to Mexico City. It's a city where it lacks a lot of cultural infrastructure until now. So contemporary art just started being uh, around until the 90s. So I will start by giving them um, the microphone to talk a little bit about their impression as artists, how they, when they started, and what, what did the context of Guadalajara offered for you? Well, I, 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 I do recall in a certain way, Guadalajara being a kind of a, of a desert in those terms. There wasn't really many things going on, except uh, there were a few individual collections that were quite particularly particular for, the, for Mexico at the time, Mexico as a country. And I guess in this kind of context where it suddenly doesn't exist an art scene, uh, things get subverted and for example an art fair which normally is the result of an art scene evolving and moving and galleries and market etc in Guadalajara somehow was the opposite because the existence of an art fair back in 1995 90, it started like 92 but I think it got its like peak around 96 was like a catalyst of a certain movement for for things to start happening in Guadalajara, and I, I think that was quite peculiar. Yes, well, uh, to continue what you're saying, uh, uh, to talk about uh, how these models of production uh, began with, uh, with alternative group of artists that got together to get, uh, to uh, found spaces to make art, uh, NAP was one of them. Probably we were the second group at that time that started uh, looking for spaces to produce art because at that time there were no galleries and of course the museums of the city were not interested in the, in the young artist scene at all as they were still interested more in, in craftship or art that have to do more with uh, established painters or and uh, so, yeah, we have to find ourselves uh, spaces. We have to find ourselves the way of uh, curating and creating uh, shows. And uh, I mean, these spaces were like some, sometimes abandoned houses. Uh, sometimes when we sort of discovered the possibility to, to do shows in a white cube. Uh, and we, for example, we sort of uh, got three squash uh, courses. Uh, to do a you know a white cube show there and so they're going on we start to fill up spaces there were no galleries and no museums you have to remark also that Guadalajara has a presence of a lot of artists throughout its history it's provided it's been the birthplace of a lot of Mexican modern artists like Jose Clemente Orozco, Chicho Reyes, architects like Luis Barragan so it was naturally the birthplace of a lot there's a lot of creativity but funnily enough everybody had to emigrate to other cities to develop their careers. So I think in the 90s, that one particularity was, as Gonzalo was saying, that the artists took control and they started providing themselves with the same, right. with spaces. I, I think something very important there is that whatever scene is today created there, in many ways, the role of the artist as producer, the artist as a agent, for the evolution of the scene was crucial because many things that happened there started as initiatives by artists. For example, the art production factory of Jose Noel Suro somehow started by his uh, brother who was an artist that passed away a few years ago. And while he was going to 
artist residence. Then he started inviting other artists that he met in those residences to come down to Guadalajara to produce art and use certain craftsmanship that locally was used in the town of Tlaquepaque in clay and these different things. No? And uh, the, the artist collectives that were at the time, like Incidental and Jalarte, that were producing art spaces and inviting artists from Mexico City and from ar abroad to do things. So the, the role of the artist there was, was very important, and I think that has given a certain shape of the scene in which there is a, more of a field of experimentation rather than a market-driven scene controlled by galleries or other other and and this this group of artists there because there, there was not a there is not still i mean not an art school or an important art school in in guadalajara so uh, the art scene became out of uh, uh, the universities but that were more in art in architect architecture or or, or communication and these are you your yeah. studies particularly yeah yeah and those groups were you know, like Alarte as well, uh, they come out from the university. You know? They were people that got ga gathered in the university and then from there start from, working in From other projects. disciplines. Other disciplines, yeah. yeah. Because in Mexico City, you also had in the 90s spaces, artists run spaces. Well, the first one, Temistocles, which Eduardo Baroa is here and was part of it. Also La Panaderia, which is a generation more near to mm -hmm. your generation. But I think one of the particularities is that Guadalajara is like a very good place to produce in the sense of, I mean, also Mexico City, but in the sense as you talked of the fabric Ceramica Suro, mm -hmm. which became like also a, an, uh, a facilitator to produce in all types of, of material, you know, with the small local workshops. Yes, there is a lot of craftsmanship. Also all the tapestry that is done, even some works here at the fair are produced there, you can see that. Yeah. So it, suddenly it was also interesting to make a link between certain artisanal types of craftsmanship, uh, make a reunion point with contemporary views of art producing. And also it's interesting that the, the production have always, uh, it's more a private sort of uh, initiative, I mean, it comes from the bottom as it's a very independent way of, of productions as the government is not involved at in any time and not even in the museums uh, uh, this is involved. So it's a separate thing, which in a way is good for us in terms of the liberty it gives you, to the freedom to, to produce things. And it's more uh, a scene that you can really do whatever you want to do and you have more uh, control what is going on. So just to like end this idea, uh, Guadalajara was really like a place that where contemporary art really had its first um, ways of uh, showing itself through this art fair that existed from 92 to 98. There were the first individual private collections of international contemporary art started in Guadalajara with Aurelio Lopez Rocha, collector who's here with us, and Patrick Charpenel and the Suros, and, uh, but still there was a need for a space, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, and how did you start it with OPA in particularly? particular? How was the idea? Um, how did it happen? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, OPA started at the, at, at the 23rd floor of a building, uh, Condominio Guadalajara, and uh, we were sharing a studio there, uh, Fernando Palomar, Jose and I were sharing this studio, and we have a, um, also a lot of space left, uh, which we were not using and it was not unused, the space. And the, the family Lopez Rocha led us the, the space to, um, to, uh, to continue to do, uh, to, inv to invite friends of us to produce art. It all started very, uh, you know, very like friend, a friendship thing going on and then it became more serious and more institutional. And we also thought at that time, then everything changed. Like now, museums were very interested in inviting new artists uh, to work with. So there was a lot of, I mean, like new generations. You can tell they have a lot of spaces to to explore and to and to produce art. And then we 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 thought it was needed to have a place where we can bring artists from uh, international artists and you know like uh, well-known artists to. Um, 
to work also with the city, to produce works yeah. in the city and to show there and involve them, whatever, in the community. Although there is an interesting link between this place and actually the art fair that happened in Guadalajara. Because at the time, that was 1997, we had a collective called Incidental that made these one night shows in very particular places and that took the context as part of its development for the main concept of the one night show. And we found this space, which is, was very peculiar as being the top floor of one of the tallest buildings with a 360 degree view on the city. And from that project, then we got the studio. And from getting the studio, somehow that developed into what is now OPA, in which at that point we decided to, to do an artist-run space which would not be a platform of self-promotion, but rather actually be an art space to be able to bring artists from abroad, that could be like Mexico City and internationally, that other young artists in the city would not have access to except by magazines or other kind of information you could get, but not like a direct uh, contact with different uh, manifestations of this. So we, that's how we decided to start with OPA in 2002. We started actually with a show um, by Amri Sala, and uh, yeah, that was in OPA. So which is now yeah, and has... Nick has one of the particular things is that many of the works shown at OPA, since if artists are invited to produce site-specific work, most of the budget doesn't go to the bringing artworks, but more into inviting and being a platform for production. And you might all recognize this photograph of Henri. It became the cover of his monograph by Faidon, which has mm -hmm. also been like very important. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, that the. Uh, we don't like to bring exhibitions uh, that are already formulated. We like to formulate the exhibitions there and to produce them there. And also uh, with a limited budget as well. So in a way, it's also like a sort of a commitment, a trade between artists and, uh, and us as producers in this, in this uh, terms. And uh, we nego nego negotiate things. And, uh, there's a lot of freedom to do things, and uh, uh, yeah, and it's not. And I, I, think I have to say that I think one of the uh, the one of the like power reasons of an artist-run space is that also the artists that come to work there, they have a really big willingness to do things. Sometimes, in many terms of lack of budget, that these artists would have in an institution, and here they wouldn't. And they wouldn't have a lot of things they would normally have, but despite all that, in their intention and this relation of artists with artists is how many things got done. So also, OPA has profited a lot into the willingness of artists wanting to, to work with, with artists. That maybe in other terms, would have been really difficult to do in terms of budget. It was a sort of like complicity between artists, no? Exactly. I mean, they, were, they could find freedom in Guadalajara in terms, maybe not so much pressure. There's no market pressure. There were no galleries demanding to have like a sellable work maybe, no? And there were or no limitations in a way, yes. no? And we no. would let, we would, we would not have a structure of an institution in terms, for example, if an artist wanted to change the project one day before, that could be done, it's actually happened, not one day, but like three days before, or projects that would perhaps be dangerous for liability, for ex uh, we really, we don't care, we do them anyway. And for example, we're seeing right now the images of a Gene Lambie show, which was in, a, in that what you're saying, there was an anecdote. Well, yeah, well, 
when Jim Lambie came to Guadalajara, we went out to lunch, and he said, so who, who else is in the show? I said, like, well, no one else, just, just you. He was like, what? Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a solo show. And there, w there has been a miscommunication between one of his galleries and OPA about this being a solo show. He thought it was a group show. But instead he said, okay, I'll do a solo show in six days. And uh, there, there, there was a very good uh, results out of it. Uh, we put a lot of friends and people working with him and he produced some new works that then he kept on somehow producing afterwards. And then you've also invited sometimes curators that even though they're not artists, the curators also feel this appeal for working in a space like OPA. But in particular, you've worked with, uh, well, all the Mexican curators basically, no? Patricia Martin, Patrick Charpenel, um, Pip Day. Guillermo Santamarina. Guillermo Santamarina. Uh, so, well, <laughs> now we're seeing uh, Yuta Casone, who's also, most of them end up what OPA, I think, is important also, is that it becomes sometimes a catalyst, no? Sometimes it starts something in, the, in terms of many of the artists that have been to OPA, have then done something to work, and then they continue coming back because they found this maybe uh, a, a way of producing that they like, no? Yeah, it's, and it's also so, it's also nice to see they get very involved with the city. We're now trying to also, we bring them to some uh, universities to, to give some artist talks, and uh, at the same time they go like, you know, all around the bars. I mean, Guadalajara, it's a seven million city, but I can tell it's like the biggest, the biggest ranch in the world. You know everybody uh, immediately. And uh, so these weeks when the artists come, they are like really moving around and talking with people and, you know, like young artists seen really get to know the artist and sometimes work with him and, you know, work with him for free as a part of, a, of, of the process. And, uh, and I think it's, it's a very uh, strong connection that the artist not only made with his work or the space, but it makes a strong, a strong connection with the, with the community, which for us is very important. And, and also, I think, not being a central stage in the world art scene brings an advantage of some artists willing to experiment and explore a bit more without feeling perhaps a certain nervousness of when they have a big profile show in New York. So in that way it serves a little bit as a laboratory for, for some of the artists who take that as an advantage, mm -hmm. put on some like new work, and from there they continue. I think the process of Kendall Gears, which is the image you're seeing right now, was a little bit like that. He did a workshop with young artists, and it started to develop into the outcast of the exhibition, right? But it wasn't yeah. like very clear what the result would be, no? Exactly. Yeah. He he just said he, he set up some rules, uh, somehow of a, a private workshop that no one could know what was going on in there except him and the participants participants and we actually didn't know what the show would be exactly about it was just about letting it happen and then having a result out of that yeah and also i think there's another very good space about choosing this kind of space which would maybe have never been chosen as an institutional space Many of the artists have also done pieces that link to the city. This is a Pedro Cabrita race that mm -hmm. was very like into this, melted in the night with the horizon of, of the city. No, in a sense. Yeah, well, yeah. The or Carlos or Bunga also. Yes. Yeah, it's in a way we try, I mean, to encourage a little bit to mix the, the show with the, I mean, in some terms with the city, with the, or sometimes with, I mean, it's in the 23rd floor of a building and it's the only tall building uh, around there. So it's, the, the view is very, it's very challenging to work with. And sometimes it competes with the view and sometimes it just uh, melts with it. Yeah. I don't know if perhaps our own past there working in 
off-site spaces, like non the typical white cube, let us, in a very natural way, appropriate that space for exhibiting, exhibiting art. And, and as you me well mentioned, some artists that come there uh, have taken advantage of that point of then suddenly being aware, denying, or or using in its favor uh, this very peculiar space. I mean, because it's a 360 degree of glass overlooking the city. Of course, there is some walls, and it has changed over the course of many exhibitions, but it's a very peculiar place to have an art space. It would normally, you don't normally would find it uh, in, the, in another city. Yes, and I think that's really important this, uh, that OPA has provided this opportunity for artists but also for the public of Guadalajara because in a sense I think the m most of the public for OPA is between 20 and 40 years more or less yeah, and it, it was really like you could see it in the, art, in the openings of OPA the amount of persons of young people that come it has really become a, a center point for the young people that, who have no opportunity of seeing international artist shows. I think there is a lot of young artists in Guadalajara over the last eight, over the last five years. There's been an explosion of, not only because of OPA, no? some things have changed also at the school. I mean, it's not only our, uh, but suddenly in Guadalajara, you can see a uh, significant growth in the amount of, of young artists uh, doing like contemporary art and not the traditional art that was being taught at the school, which was had a very archaic program. How you can see it from that point also to the level of like the, the, the cleaning team of the building, which work at, 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 at OPA as well for cleaning in the space and they have been like very involved with exhibitions and now they are starting also with their own way to produce art and I don't know, probably will be an interesting of exhibition course. one day. For example, can you tell us a little bit about the Monika Sosnowska show which we're seeing right now? Uh, in yes, she, I mean, it w that project was very interesting because it was the first artist who somehow wanted to deny or play against the magnificent view and then created this uh, this somehow endless corridor, I wouldn't say a labyrinth, but that, that would actually make you feel in another, in a completely different place than that one. And at that point it was like the first project that denied uh, the, the very aspect of the, of the space. And I remember Monica Sosnowska saying that this was an idea that she wanted to develop, but that as you see it, she would have never been able to produce it anywhere else in the world because of so many like limitations and security and regulations. Yeah, for emergency exits and emergency exit signs. And she said like, she, she, was, she was like, well, can we do this and not put an exit sign? Yes, of course. Can we not? Yes, of course. We, we, we always try to say yes to everything the artist wants. Always. I, I don't recall having said no for one single petition. Project. And another um, anecdote is maybe also, well, obviously this building is an office building, so there's sometimes trouble getting people in after the openings. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, but it becomes a very particular place in all senses, like to um, bring a horse for the Anrizala photo shoot was not easy either. Yeah. We <laughs> 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 have to uh, get it in the eleva elevator. And in an uh, office building full of lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Oh yeah, that's something to say. It's full of lawyers. <laughs> no. Yeah. We, and we, I mean, we we have to, we have to fight against a lot against 
the administration of the building. Because sometimes they say, why do you want to, I don't know, take tons of bricks up, up there and then to put them, like, are you building something? No, no, it's a, for uh, an installation. Or why do you want to bring down a white horse in the elevator at 2 p.m.? Or this, they cannot, uh, that's the institution we fight against. Exactly. The administration of the building. Yeah. So maybe we have just a, two more minutes left. Maybe we, if you, anybody wants to, uh, do you pose any questions to Jose and Gonzalo about this kind of uh, experience in, in a city? Or not? <laughs> what is next? Well, right now, OPA, I think, is in a very particular point in time. But you could answer mm -hmm. it. Well, we have a, a great new director, <laughs> uh, which is really changing a lot of things because, well, we have to say we direct the place for seven years and it was a mess. Um, you know, we put a lot of our uh, heart and soul on it, but, but we were a mess because we were at the same time doing our career as an artist and, uh, and uh, yeah, they, they, you know, didn't uh, work uh, that professional as an institution, which which I uh, proud to say that now is it's it's going that direction, and we we sort of now are, are giving more time to our to our careers and the, yes. and just being part of the board, which was the yeah that's. I I I also guess the the challenge we're facing there is how to continue having OPA existing, being professionalized in certain ways but never losing the original aspects that made OPA what OPA is. So that's a challenge because somehow it's a, it's a certain contradiction in those terms, but we're, we're working on how to establish that relationship. Uh, being us more away and the place being more professional in many, in many aspects, but without losing the, the artist run freedom and experimentation that had since the beginning. I think so. Well, I think, um, yeah, I think, well, to talk as me as a director, it's a complete challenge because working in museums and in other types of spaces, obviously the last thing I want OPA to lose is its spontaneity and it's uh, the freedom it projects for the artist. All the benefits an artist could see about working at OPA, no? even though they won't, maybe they'll have to sacrifice a per diem or something like that. But on the other hand, we have to still be able to provide to them a unique opportunity to really like pursue maybe a project that I haven't been able to work for in a long time. So it is a challenge, but it's uh, now a, a joint uh, work task. Yes. Hi, um, I'm wondering where the budget comes from. Where you guys, you know, is it donations? Is it? Yes, we, yeah, we 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 we've been having one. Uh, the the well, the space is owned by the 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 family Lopez Rocha, which they are a, a, they have a collection, and also they were the ones to start to promote the the first art fair. Uh, all that Aurelio. And also Televisa owns a part of the. Yeah. The terrace of the, of the, of the terrace, the the Humex collection, which Humex collection, it's the most supportive institution in Mexico. They give more money to the arts than the government. And and, and different o over the course of eight years, some different uh, individuals and in different moments, different years have helped. But we're naming the ones that have been. I mean, constant hopefully not over. forgetting anyone, but uh, con more constant about over the last eight years. We have also made a model which works very fine. All the artists that have been showing at OPA, we ask them to, uh, to uh, donate a, a, an edition of 30 uh, works of sometimes drawings, and we make a box, which is called the OPA box. And the, so it was an edition of 30, and we, we've been selling these boxes to, to founding the place as well. 
that was a good model. No, that's still been working. Now we're working on the second. In the second top of box. The second top of box. So if everyone wants to contribute, you know, you can <laughs> <laughs> ask information. Any other question? The next project we're working on right now, we have a Dora Garcia show that just opened last Thursday. And next year we have Superflex, which is a Danish collective artist, which is a, it also it's an exhibition that it's much more than an exhibition. It's a project of biogas, but it's on its third edition. So in Mexico, it will really uh, hopefully transcend. Mm -hmm. And then Fernanda, there's uh, Fernanda, Fernanda Gomez, Gomez, Brazilian young artist, and uh, Gabriel Sierra also, and um, Roman, Roman Ondak. Ondak. And yeah. yeah, we're just, and we're keeping yeah. up the invitations to continue the program. Any other question? Bueno. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You.